Hey, welcome to Church Experience Online. We're so happy you joined us today. As you're watching this teaching video, if you have any questions or need help getting connected, please feel free to contact us by phone or email. Also, our website is the best place to go to get access to helpful growth step resources. Join a serving team, connect in a life group, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially by giving online. At the end of this teaching video, you'll hear a Church Experience Worship original song. We hope this gives you time to worship and reflect on what you've just learned. Thanks again for joining Church Experience Online. From the studios at Countryside High School in beautiful Clearwater, Florida, it's time for You Asked For It! Now put your hands together as we welcome your pastor, Brandon Bros. Well, it's great to be together again today. I and mean, wouldn't you agree, isn't this awesome to be together worshiping? Yeah. I did not like having to cancel services last week because we didn't get to be together, but I did have a friend send me a message that Sunday, and he said that was your best message yet. And so... Uh, but I uh, know I miss being with you guys. It's been, it's been great to see everybody again and uh, to be back together. And I hope you weather the storm well, regardless of uh, what you had to go through. But I'm, I'm glad you made it here today. A lot to be thankful for. And I'll tell you what, one of the cool things that came out of this last week was to see church experience people stepping up and serving their neighbors, helping, uh, looking for needs, ways to help others, not just thinking about themselves, but thinking about others. And I think that's awesome. Would you agree? I think that's very cool. It was our, our church's first hurricane. This church did not exist the last time a major hurricane rolled through here. So that we, we weathered it together. It was our church's first hurricane. You know, it was my first hurricane. Uh, I've never lived in Florida where a direct kind of hit had come through. And uh, this was a first experience for me. And so I didn't know whether I should stay and kind of hold down the fort or evacuate. And I started to get an idea uh, as it got closer of what I should do. See, I, I naturally like adventures. I, I like to be a part of the excitement. And, and, you know, the adrenaline rush. And so there was kind of a little bit of that mixed into the craziness and the fear that everybody had. There's also like, well, what's going to happen? It's my first time. And, and uh, you know, I, I was just interested in what this experience is going to be like. Went to the grocery store and I saw all the bread and all the water had sold out. I'm like, okay, that's not good. When that stuff starts happening, that's, something's going on, right? And then, and then I see like people, like neighbors, boarding up their windows. I'm like, okay, that did not happen in the Midwest, Right? And in other places I've lived, I've never seen that happen. So I'm like, this is, this is a big deal. But then when I started to think I needed to evacuate was when I was driving past the gas station and all, there's this huge line of cars and I hear people talking about gas stations running out of gas. And I picture millions of people evacuating Florida at the same time with no gas, being stuck on a highway and a hurricane blowing through. I'm like, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> and so I'm like, everybody get your stuff and get in the car. If you're not there in five minutes, you get left behind. I'm sorry. I love you kids, but I only need like two or three of you, you know, to get in the car. We're good. No, so, so we made it. Thankfully, everybody got packed up and we evacuated. And, you know, I was trying to leave the storm and all the mess that it was going to cause in Florida. I was trying to get away from that. I get to Georgia. We walk into the lobby of our hotel that we were going to stay in for a couple nights, and I realized that the hurricane had hit the lobby of my hotel. Like, they were under this mass renovation, and we walked in, and it looked like literally a hurricane hit. It was just crazy. We go downtown Atlanta, and uh, it, was, it was a neat opportunity to be there. I actually happened to be there on a night that 12 Stone, our partner church, was doing a prayer meeting on Friday night. And so I was thankful I had that to look forward to in the evening because Friday on the day, we went downtown Atlanta, and uh, when we were there, we uh, were going in to have a family experience and one of the tourist kind of uh, things they have downtown. And we, we were going to park, and there's two parking lots I could choose from. There, we couldn't fit in the parking garage. We had a car top carrier on the top of the vehicle. So there was like the $10 parking lot, and then there was the $5 parking lot, which was next to the railroad tracks on the other side of the street. And so I thought, well, I'm going to save five bucks. I'm just going to park over here. I don't mind walking. I dropped the family out, parked right next to the railroad tracks, hopped out, went in, did our deal, came back out several hours later and go to get the car, and my back window is busted out. I'm thinking, man, I should have parked in the $10 lot. And I look inside the vehicle, and we had this bag of food uh, that was sitting in my daughter's car seat, and it looked like a purse, but it was still there. And so I thought, okay, they busted out my window, and they thought it was a purse. They realized it was food, and they're like, I don't want any wheat thins. I'm going to move on to the next vehicle. So they took off. 
So uh, I fly down an officer. I told him, I'm like, do I need to do anything? He's like, do you have anything missing? I said, no, not that I'm aware of. And he said, all right, well, you don't really need to do anything. You just got to fix your window. And so it's an inconvenience, you know, on the road. And so we're thinking about how we're going to fix the window. Thankful nothing got stolen. I go to the prayer meeting. And then uh, we get back to our hotel that night. We're unloading everything. And I realized my backpack that I had taken with me uh, was not there. I'm thinking, that's what they took. They took my backpack, and I was bummed because, you know, there's things in there that you're going to have to replace, the computer and all this kind of stuff, a few hundred dollars of just things that were in there. But the, the, those things can be replaced. The thing that I was so disappointed by was I had, in good preparation, in thorough preparation from the hurricane, I had taken every important document of our family and put them in my backpack. So I didn't want them to get ruined by water and wind if our windows got blown out and if there was water damage in the house. So I took everything, all the kids' social security cards, their birth certificates, our marriage license, my ordination certificates, the title to the car, you name it. I was thorough. Every important document, I'm like, I got to keep this stuff safe. I'm going to keep it with me. I'm going to keep it in my vehicle. Never thought about someone busting out my window and taking every important document. I had a couple of mentoring books. Of, I'm blessed to have some of the best mentors in the world as far as pastors go, and I, I get to sit down with them regularly. I take detailed notes. I learn from them. I go back and look at those. I had those in my backpack. There was some irreplaceable stuff in there, some family stuff. I mean, our medical records, everything that you can imagine that is important, I put in that backpack because I didn't want it to get ruined by a hurricane. And, you know, the ironic timing of this message, the the day that we canceled services, the 10th, I was going to teach on why does God allow suffering in the world. And did you ever have something happen to you, and maybe it was much worse than what I'm describing, maybe it's just the minor irritations of daily life, and you think, God, why did you allow that to happen? God, 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 why? Maybe you were doing something good. Maybe you were serving somebody else, and something bad happened to you. You think, God, why why did you allow that to happen? I don't get it. It's probably, you know, we're in this teaching series, you asked it, and it's probably the most asked question that people have. In fact, it was Lee Strobel who said that he commissioned a national survey, and he asked people what question that they would ask God if they could only ask one thing. And he said the number one response, this national survey, the number one response is why is there suffering in the world? That's what people want to ask God. That's the number one you ask for it question Why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow bad things happen to good people? Now, uh, Lee said, ironically, in in the survey, there was a statistical quirk that that there was those who were married were much more likely to indicate they wanted to know why does God allow suffering in the world. But that was just, (laughs) but nevertheless, he asked the question, why, why, why does God allow suffering? And, you know, a helpful verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 It says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. So we don't see everything clearly as we will one day when we're standing before God in eternity. And so there is mystery to it. And so we're going to try, and I'm going to do my best to answer from Scripture the, the, the answer to that question, why does God allow suffering as much as I can? But in the end, it really is a mystery, right? It's like we don't always have the answer to our why questions. I mean, sometimes we do. Sometimes later on we look back and we're like, okay, this happened and then there was this purpose in it. God, I see why you allowed that. But it's not like the logical mathematical formula that every time you get to the end of some horrible suffering experience, you look and you say, okay, I, I see. That, that was clearly, okay, I, I totally get it. You know, it's like we, we don't. In this, in this world we see, we see like foggy. It's, 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 it's kind of like mysterious. I, I don't understand. Like, God, why, why did you let that happen? And, and you're saying, God, there's this, this thing that happened in my life. And I, I, get, I, had a, I had a great friend, accountability partner in my 20s, and he just had his first kid, great man of God, serving the Lord, worship leader, just an incredible guy. And he's driving down the highway and gets hit and dies, and it's like it was no fault of his own, couldn't have seen it coming. It's like, God, why did you allow that? We don't, we don't have all the answers. Sometimes you go on and you see, I mean, his, his wife uh, you know, went on and got to tell her story to tens of thousands of people and was on national television and now is remarried and has a family and has got a musical career for the Lord that she's using in sharing the story. And so, I, okay, I can, I can see a purpose in that, God, but not that you still would choose that. or any, I can see purpose, but what about when you can't? What, what about when there's, there's pain and there's problems in the world and we ask questions, our friends that are spiritually lost say, well, I, why would God allow suffering? How do you answer it? And it's a question I think that we've all asked. And here's the core of it. I want to share a few thoughts from Andy Staley that were so, so helpful. I think will help you. He said, you know, the core of it is if God is good, then he would. 
right? Isn't that kind of the core of your question? Is if God is good, then he would. He would stop suffering, right? And, and if he could, then he would. If God could stop it, then he would, right? So it's, it's kind of like when you're outside looking in, not from a Christian worldview, you're saying, well, well, I don't know if I believe in a God who would allow suffering because if he was really good, he wouldn't do that. And if he was powerful enough to stop it, then I don't think he wouldn't. It's kind of the core of it. But he said that there's no rational argument against the God of, that Jesus presented based on injustice in the world, bad things happening to good people. There's no rational argument to, to say that Christianity is not true or powerful based on that argument because actually our faith was built on the fact that something really horrible happened to the only really good person, that was Jesus, who was perfect and without sin. And uh, although he was innocent, something horrible happened to him. He was persecuted and eventually executed on a cross, and he didn't deserve it. And so our whole faith is built on this, and and he said, you know, our faith wouldn't have made it out of the first century if it was built on the idea that God doesn't allow suffering for good people, because if you think about it, all the heroes died. Jesus, his disciples, his closest followers, they, they died. And Jesus said, come, take up your cross and follow me. And, you know, it's, it's, there's going to be suffering marked on that path. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's not that God ever said there won't be problems. In fact, Jesus promised the opposite. He said, in this world, you will have problems. So, so the question of how could God exist if he allows suffering, I mean, that's, God never said that there wouldn't be suffering, even to good people. But, but here's the first lesson in your notes. And you, you have some lessons there. I'm going to give you the first part of it this week. I'm going to finish with the second half of it next week, and I hope you'll be here. It's going to be a great, powerful conclusion to this. But let me give you this first lesson in your notes, and I encourage you to write it down. God can bring purpose out of pain. He can bring purpose out of pain. You know, at the beginning, as you look back, I mean, God didn't create suffering. He doesn't find joy in it. Um, he allows it for some reason, and we wonder, we do wonder why, but but. He didn't, he didn't create it. He wasn't the initiator. He didn't try to bring pain into our lives. In fact, quite the opposite. He created a world in the very beginning that was without pain and suffering, that was without death. Jesus, uh, when he came, he came to solve the problem that sin created. And again, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. But in Genesis, if you look back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, this is after after Adam and Eve had sinned against God and they had disobeyed him, they had rebelled against God and they did what he said not to do, you can see there's consequences to that. Genesis chapter three, verse 17, it says, to Adam, God said, this is after he had sinned, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you and through painful, painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the fields. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So there's, there's pain that's brought in the world. There's, there's suffering because of sin. It's, it's a result of sin that pain came into the world. You know, the devil, when he was in heaven, Lucifer, he, he decided he wanted God's job, and there was this pride in him, and he, he, he wanted to elevate himself instead of elevate God, and so he, along with a third of the angels, were kicked out of heaven, and so that's the, the good and the bad evil in this world, this, this, this battle that's going on, is the devil's trying to destroy God's creation. He's trying to get at God, ultimately, so because God loves you, he's trying to destroy your life, and so he comes into Adam and Eve, and he tries to tempt them to do what God said not to do, and, and they, they bite on the hook, and they're hooked, and they take that road, and it leads to all kinds of misery in our world. You and I are not exempt from that. We're a part of that problem. We have all sinned, as the Bible says, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but once sin came into the world, it brought destruction. As one person said, when, when we humans told God to shove off, and we said, we're going to do it our own way, we're not going to listen to you, uh, God partially honored our request. Nature began to revolt. The earth was cursed. Genetic breakdown and disease began. Pain and death became part of the human experience. God allowed the consequences of sin to come into the world. And perhaps one of the reasons why he did that was so that we would see the damage of sin. So that we, when we see pain and suffering in the world, we would see that, and no one's exempt from it, right? But, but that we would see the damaging requirements 
uh, result of sin, the consequence of sin. Not just other people's sin, but our sin too, which keeps us from living in sin. And we see how bad it is. Death is the ultimate expression of the consequence of sin, right? And, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging question. Why do bad things happen to good people? And I, I want you to hear just a few minutes from uh, one of my mentors, Pastor Kevin Myers of 12 Stone Church, on that question. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Because of sin. Sin brings death, disease, sorrow, loss, suffering. That's what sin did. All of us are experiencing the fallout, the effects of sin. God said to Adam and Eve, when you sin, you will surely die. We don't take this stuff seriously, but it's very serious. We kind of dismiss it, no big deal. But see, no one is immune to the consequence. So you're like, well, that can't be the answer. No, that is the answer. Is it? One of my favorite cars we ever had was back when, when I was you know, about 26 to 30. We owned a CRX, a Honda CRX. This was back at the end of the 80s, early 90s. And unfortunately, it was my wife's car, and I really wanted it to be my car. And so we bought it new, and we were very excited that season of time. And, and, and I preferred to drive the car as often as I could. So one day, I was driving the car, and she had mine, and <clears throat> it was pouring down heavy rain. That's my excuse. And the tires were, you know, needed to be replaced. That's more of my excuse. And, and, and I had to get somewhere, and that's why I was driving a little too fast. And, and then I hydroplaned, and I did a helicopter. And when I did, I went into the curb up on And I didn't hit a tree. I didn't hit another car. I did nothing. I just went right up on the side, hitting the, hitting the curb. And, and I thought, oh, thank you, God, that nothing happened. And so then I drove the car away, and it, it didn't drive right. <laughs> you know what it was? Something was, was funky about the, the steering and the driving, and so I knew that. And, and so the next day, I, I took it in and to the shop, and the shop looked at it, and, I, and they called me, and they said, uh, uh, Mr. Myers, uh, we have bad news for you. Your car is totaled. I said, how can my car be totaled? It looks awesome. <laughs> we didn't even touch the paint. Nothing got scratched. The, car was, the car's in perfect condition. The guy said, let me explain it to you. He said, you, you, you know what a shoebox looks like? Uh, yeah. Four corners? Yeah. None of your tires are in the corners. They belong. <laughs> your entire frame is twisted. Your car is totaled. I don't care how it looks. Underneath, it's totaled. Sin has totaled our soul. It's undone us. We keep looking on the outside and say, oh, I'm awesome, everything's great. This is, no, 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 no. Look underneath. It's why life doesn't ride right. And it's cost us. And this is serious business, and we don't think of it that way. Now let me answer the question from a Christian worldview. Listen. Why do bad things happen to good people? They don't. Because there are no good people. Because we've all sinned. You see, only God is good. In the context of who and what is good, only God is good. And nobody's equal to God. Romans 3.10 tells us, no one is righteous. No one seeks after God. All of us live in a world of sin, and all of us have sinned. Now, the non-Christian worldview is going to dismiss that. But if you're answering the question from Scripture, no one is good. Therefore, why do bad things happen to good people? They don't. In fact, the truth is we live with the consequences of the fallout of sin in the world, the sin choices of other people, and our own sins. And somewhere along the combination of all that, he said we would suffer, and we do. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. So we're not exempt from sin. We've, we've all sinned, and we're not exempt from the consequence of sin. Not just our own sin, but the sins of others, and living in a fallen world filled with people who have sinned and have destroyed God's original paradise. When we rebelled against God, it caused the whole world to rebel against the way God created it. And, and nature, every part of the world is not how it was meant to be. And, and we see that all around us, don't we? We see suffering. We experience suffering. And every time we see it, our, result, our response should not be to blame God. Say, God, why did you do this to us? It's like, man, that's, that's what sin does. When you see death, that's what sin does. When you, when you see horrible things happen in the world, that's what sin does. Violence, 
pain. Sin does that. Abuse, horrible stuff. Some in this room have experienced horrible things. Like, and it, it, was, it was sin that did that. It was the devil that did that. Don't blame God. Don't push away the one who's there with you in the pain and wants to help you and wants to bring good and a purpose out of the pain. And, and see, here's the amazing thing. God can bring purpose out of pain. He's so good at it. He's so good at it. Well, there's a lot of reasons why God may allow pain in our lives. And again, it's a mystery. We don't fully understand it, but there's, there's lessons you can learn from it. There's, there's things that God can bring good out of the bad, and we can look for those things. You know, when I was in high school, I was given a great job. Uh, I, w- I was given a sledgehammer, some tools, and, and told that there was this old barn. I just need to tear it down. And that, that was my job. They're like, just destroy this thing. I'm like, are you serious? You're gonna pay me to do this? I would do this for fun. Like, I would do this just like on my free time. Just let me swing at this thing. And so that was my job, was to tear the thing down. And I was having a great time doing it. And, and it was a little careless at one point. And I stepped on a board that had a nail sticking up through it, went right through my foot. And I'm talking like deep into my foot, some serious pain. And I, I felt it. And, you know, I was walking around with a limp the next day. And just anytime I put pressure on it, there was, there was pain. And unfortunately, before the end of the job, before I finished it, uh, I was tearing this thing down. I wasn't paying fully attention to where I was stepping. And I stepped on another board on the other foot, and the nail went through my other foot. And I, so now I'm like hobbling around. I can't put pressure anywhere without experiencing pain. Everywhere I walk, it's just pain, 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 pain. You ever feel like that in life? Like everywhere you turn, it's just like this is a bad week. This is a bad day. And, and it's just, it was kind of like that. And, but you know you learn lessons from it. Good comes out of it, and you, you think, I don't think since that time in my life, I don't think I've ever stepped on a nail again. Not that it won't happen, but I hope it doesn't, and I learned my lesson to be careful around nails, especially old rusty nails pointed up at you, just like, watch out. Well, this, this weekend, we were helping my neighbor's fence had fallen down in the hurricane, and we helped him get it all out, and he's pulling the whole thing out, and we helped put it on the road, and I had my kids help me, and I told my boys as we were doing this, I said, guys, don't step on any nails, like, right? It's experience is speaking. So now I can help them. My, my mess, my previous pain can help them and their pain. But you know what? If you don't ever experience pain and suffering yourself, maybe you don't know how serious it is. And not that they weren't being careful, but at one point in the day, we're hauling all the wood out to the front. And one of my boys stepped on a plank with a nail in it and went up in his foot. And he's like, Dad, I'm bleeding. And he showed me where the nail in it. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I've been there. <laughs> I know what you're feeling right now. And I'm really sorry that you experienced that. But you know, he's, he's going to learn. I think he's going to do that again. He's, he's going to wear it, but now when he walks around this weekend, he's got a little limp. He's, he's feeling the, the pain. And, and, you know, and then you can ask questions like, well, okay, there was an innocent, okay, I'm his dad, so I know he's not innocent, but he's innocent young kid helping somebody else, trying to do something good, and then he experiences pain. How does that, God, why, why would you let something like that happen? This is a little microcosm of the bigger question we ask. God, if you could, why don't you, why don't you, keep these kinds of things from happening. I'm trying to do something good in my life and I'm trying to help others. I'm trying to whatever. You fill in the blank and then this happens or you allowed this or this horrible thing happens in the world. God, why would you allow it? You know, one of the things that Charles Stanley says is that pain and suffering alerts us to danger, the danger of sin. Like similar to a kid touching the hot stove realizes not to ever do that again because the pain taught them a lesson, brought wisdom into their life. And there's not only that, but there's this awareness that sin leads to death. Sin leads to destruction, ultimate destruction, of course, in in hell, being separated from God forever. And so when we step out of sight, outside of what God commands us in the Bible in any area of of, of our life, and he says, hey, this is how you're to live, and we step outside. The pain in this world is to remind us is that that this pain is temporary, but there will be an eternal separation from God. That that will be unending for those who choose to reject God. He'll he'll let you, and we talked about that again a couple of weeks ago, and why would God send people to hell and all that kind of stuff, and we talked about how it's not so much that he sends it, it's that we choose it. We we choose to push him away and kind of do things our own way, and and he kind of allows us to, to experience the consequence of that. And so sin, here's the lesson in your notes. Sin brings suffering into the world. It's not that God, uh, God is up there in heaven uh, with a smile on his face when he experiences suffering. His heart's breaking. That's not, wasn't, that wasn't his creation. But when, when we as broader humanity sinned, it brought pain. But again, good can come from the pain that we experience. And, and maybe when people say, you know, it was like hell on earth. Maybe it is when you suffer. Maybe it's a glimpse of what eternity would be like for those who reject God. 
and it's maybe a wake-up call, maybe suffering is maybe good medicine for us, maybe it's a good kind of hurt to, for us to see that this world is not permanent, this is not our home, this is a temporary place for us to love God and love others, but there will be a day when God wipes away all pain and suffering, it's just not here in this life. And when you go through hell on earth, it's a glimpse of what it's like when you don't walk with God forever in eternity. And, you know, I was at the doctor's office a while back. I'd taken all four of our kids. We, we went in for just routine checkups. Thought it'd be a good time-saving idea. It sounded good on the front end to just do them all at the same time. And when we all got packed into that little doctor's office and we're waiting forever for them to come and all four kids in there, trying to keep them entertained with no toys or anything, like, then I realized maybe it wasn't the best idea to schedule them all at the same time. But we're in there in the room waiting, and uh, my daughters needed to get shots. My, my boys did not, but they didn't know that. And so I had been messing with them all up to the point of the, before we got there saying, hey man, I'm sorry, you guys are gonna have to get shots. You know, like a lot of them, like a whole bunch of them just everywhere. It's gonna be real bad. And they're like, dad, really? And like they're all, they're all freaked out about it. And, and I know you're saying that's like a horrible parenting thing. They're gonna always hate the doctor's office, but I'm just telling you how it was. And I, I'm telling them it's gonna be bad. And the, the nurse comes in and it's like, all right, I'm just giving shots to the, the daughters. And she, she pokes them and, you know, there's some tears on their little cheeks. And, and I was messing with her and I said, hey, you know, what kind of job is this? You make little kids cry all day? I mean, how can you sleep at night? You know, I'm just totally messing with her and she's smiling, laughing. We're, we're having a good time. But I was just kidding around. But if you think about it, really, it was, it was true. I mean, when, when the kids leave, when she's done, like a lot of times there's, there's tears on the face. But what she's doing is actually good for them. She's helping them. She's doing exactly what she needs to do and, and what needs to happen in that moment. But when they, when they leave the room, there's tears on their face. There's, there's been pain. But there was a purpose in it. And, and all I'm saying is that, that we don't know why God allows it and why did this happen and you can track back the different painful experiences in your life. God, why did someone do this to me? They stole this, they, they, they broke this in my life, they hurt me in this way, this happened. God, why did you allow that? We don't have all the answers. But what we do know is God is a master at bringing purpose out of our pain. And if you'll let him, if you'll let him do his work and you'll be surrendered to him, not get angry at him, push him away in the times of pain, but allow his presence to come in the times of pain, God will guide you through it. Even when there's injustice that's done to you, around you, and there's horrible things that happen in our world, you can find so many times purpose in it. You know, one of the things I was encouraged by uh, post-hurricane is to see how many church experienced people. I, I saw multiple notes of people going to help other people, help their neighbors, help do some good in the community because of the storm. And so none of us would have chosen. In fact, we prayed real hard that God, and thank God that it wasn't worse than it was. But it was, it was bad for some people. A lot of damage was done. But in the midst of it, there was good that was happening. So God brought good even out of a bad situation. Now, God didn't create the world with hurricanes. From what we know, it was as a result of the sin that God, uh, the, the consequence that God allowed because of the sin that we created in this world. So why does God allow suffering? We don't have all those answers. We can only guess from what we know of scripture that, that he allows it ultimately though what we do know is that it was a consequence of our sin and sin brings suffering God doesn't stop us every time we go to sin because there's going to be a consequence he doesn't just stop us dead in our tracks I remember my first vehicle I was hearing the story about PK's first vehicle and my, my, my first one was a Honda Civic I had saved up for it I had worked in a furniture factory all summer uh, to save up the money that I could buy it from a friend. And I was so excited, and I worked for this vehicle. I got it. I was freedom. You know, I'm 16 years old. I can go out and go wherever I want. And, and I go over to a friend's house. It's Michigan. It's in the winter. And I pull into his driveway, and I got stuck in a snowbank. Well, as a 16-year-old, when your vehicle's stuck, this is like the end of the world because it's like your freedom is tied up. And so I had to get loose. And no matter what I did, rocking the car back and forth, I couldn't get out of the snowbank. Well, I, I see that every time I rev the engine, I'm 16, right? I'm first car, first time driver. I see this, this gauge on the dash. It's like the RPMs, revolutions per minute. And it's, it's just kind of topping out every time I hit the gas and I'm not going anywhere. And I, I see this red zone. I'm thinking, is that like a turbo booster? You know what I'm saying? And I'm like pressing this down and, and, I, and, I, and I, 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 I floor it all the way to the end. And what happens? I blow my engine. The whole thing just died right there. My first car just done. Never to drive again. It was junk. And I was so disappointed because I worked so hard for that car. But, but I learned a lesson. There was consequence because of my action, and I've never done that 
action again because I know there's a big consequence. Well, what if God, every time you were doing something wrong, let's go with the driving and car experience. Let's just say you were just going over the speed limit and you, in a, in a 25, you went 26. And what if God just locked up your car every time you broke a law? Like, and you just, you went a little bit over the speed limit and your car just shut down, your transmission went out, you could never drive again just because like you went over one, one line, you crossed it, God, consequence immediate. What if God did that? If God did that, what he would be doing was, would be no longer really giving you a choice because you would see the obvious consequence of your sin so clearly. There, there, would, be no, there would be no room for you to logically in, in, in any way choose anything other than to just follow exactly the pattern that is put in front of you. It would no longer be a relationship of love it would be logic. You would follow the laws, for example, in the driving scenario. You, you would follow not because of it's safe to not drive wildly. You would do it because you didn't want a consequence. You, you wouldn't drive well because you were concerned about the others on the road and you cared about others. You would only drive for one fact, fear. You would not want to have the consequence. God allows enough suffering in the world for us to see that there's a consequence and to be aware of that. And that's part of what fearing God is, that respect that there, there's a consequence. But he gives us choice. Every time you sin and make a mistake, he doesn't in that moment give you what you deserve. But he says, here's what sin does. Sin destroys. And there's suffering in the world so that you will see that your sins, oh, there's also God's grace, there's also justice, and there's also suffering because of sin in the world. So God is gracious, but he allows enough suffering so that we can see the result of it, the pain that's brought into the world. You know, Kevin Myers asked the question, couldn't God solve our pain now? I mean, we know he does eventually in eternity. He wipes all tears away. But what about now? Couldn't God solve it for us now? Why, why couldn't for us, at least us as believers, couldn't God solve pain? It's a great question. I want you to hear just two more quick minutes on that question. But couldn't he solve it here and now? L let, me, let me touch on that. I mean, couldn't God? Okay, yes, he can solve it ultimately. Okay, I get that. I concede that. Christian worldview, the kindness of God, the mercy of God through Jesus, yes. But what about right now? Couldn't he solve it here and now? Couldn't he remove the pain and sorrow and suffering here and now? Well, listen, the truth is because pain and sorrow and suffering and disease and death and loss come as a result of sin in the world, as a result of other people's sin that they choose and it impacts me, as a result of my sin that I choose and it impacts me, the collective of it all leaves it in this world because that's the true condition if God were to intervene every time someone makes a potential decision that could cause pain on someone else or on themselves, God would have to remove free will. Isn't that interesting? Because we're a curious people, aren't we? We at one and the same time want to exercise our free will, but then we got, want God to remove the pain and the suffering of the consequences. That would be as foolish as saying, I want the freedom to be able to smoke if I desire to, and that's your freedom in this world. But then if I get lung cancer, I want to sue the tobacco company. That's kind of insane. I mean, if you chose the freedom, the consequences go with it. And we love the free will that God has given us. Then we have to take responsibility for the consequences. He could not remove the pain, the suffering, the loss, without removing our free will. If you wrestle with that, you say, man, that needs a deeper discussion for me. Good. Go spend some time with C.S. Lewis. He's the author of the book, The Problem of Pain. It's not a light book. It's, it's not for shallow thinking. But it will help you profoundly wrestle through this. So why does God allow suffering? You know, we're going to pick up the conversation more next week. And, man, there's so much more for God to do in us through this. But... One thing I want to encourage you with is this. If you're going through suffering right now, if, if you experience suffering in this coming season of your life, we know that all of us are going to experience it. You have experienced it. You will. These words are for you from Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. God, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. The season we're in in this life is... There is suffering, there's pain, there's so many joys, and life is good in a lot of ways, but then you see the other side of the coin at times, and in the end, we know that we're going to pass away, so there's, there's, there's suffering in this world. 
But in the midst of all of that, we have hope as believers, and we can say crazy, audacious things like the best is yet to come because we actually believe that those who follow Jesus, who are living for him, when we die, that's not the end. That's not, there's not ultimate suffering in the end for those who are in Jesus. There's, there's paradise that awaits us. There's, where, there's a place where there will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. So we're headed to uh, an amazing experience with Christ. It's, the best way I've ever heard it described is this, and maybe this will help you. It's, it's probably the best illustration I've ever, I've ever heard on this idea of, of our suffering now compared to the great joy we have before us. Imagine that 2018 starts out for you really bad. Uh, maybe the first day of January 1st, you wake up and you realize right off the bat that it's a horrible, going to be a horrible day. Everything is going wrong. You decide that you're just going to go into work. You know, it's New Year. Everyone else is off. Going to get a little work done. You show up. Your boss happens to be there. And you ask him why he's there. He's like, well, I'm sorry. I'm reorganizing some things because tomorrow we're going to lay everybody off. And I'm sorry you lost your job. And it's like the first day of the new year. You're hoping it'll be great. You lose your job. You go home and you, you find out that you're, this person you're in a relationship with, they just got some really bad news too from their family and someone's sick and there's some bad things going on. You're discouraged by that. You guys decide to go out for a drive. You get in the car and it won't start. Your car breaks down and you figure out that it's, it's something that's, that's really bad mechanically and you lost your car. It's, it's done. And, and then you just start to realize like as the day goes on, it just gets worse and worse and worse. I mean, everything is going wrong. It's a horrible day, probably the worst day of your life. You decide at the end of the day after everything has gone wrong that could possibly go wrong in your world that you're just going to go to sleep and get some rest. You go to bed, you wake up the next day, and you're excited because it's not January 1st anymore. That was the worst day of your life. But January 2nd is different. On January 2nd, everything started going really well for you. In fact, like, it went great. I mean, you, you got a call from someone that you used to know, and they offered you a job, and it was like your dream job. And, and they said, well, why don't you come in today? And you show up, and they, they got this corner office for you, and it's incredible, and you got this amazing view. And, and then, then you, they give you a bonus on your first day, or just a signing bonus. Hey, here you go. And then you get home, and, and, and everything's better. The news that it was bad is, is, is now good. And, you know, and, and then you have a friend call up, and he's like, man, I just won the lottery, and, and here's $10 million. I just want to have so much. I'm just going to hook you up. And then, and, and then you decide, well, all this, I'm going to go on my dream vacation. And so you take off to Tahiti for six months. You're gone for six months. You come back, and just life is bliss. Everything's amazing. It's the best year of your life. I mean, literally 364 days, everything went exactly how you wanted it to. It was, just, it was absolutely perfect. You get to the end of the year. It's New Year's Eve. You're hanging out with one of your good friends, and you're, you're just kind of chilling on your new yacht. And, and you're, you're talking, and he's like, man, Man, what a great year. You've just, everything has gone perfect for you. I mean, they put your, your face on the cover of a magazine, like man of the year. I mean, that's amazing. Like everything's been incredible. But, but I remember like, wasn't January 1st? Didn't you have like a really bad day? I remember you calling me up and telling me how horrible it was. And you think back and you're like, yeah, you know what? I kind of forgot about that, but you're right. That was a, that was a bad day. But man, I'll tell you what, I don't really, I don't really remember that anymore. Because the last 364 days have been incredible. They've, they've been amazing, and so I, I would say overall, it's been an exceptional year. It's been the best year of my life, and you're like, but I thought that was the worst day of your life. It was, but I mean, it was nothing compared to the next 364 days. They were incredible, and that's just a little bit of what it's going to be like when you get to heaven times an infinite number because here's the thing eternity is unending and it's paradise and there is no pain and there is no suffering you'll remember the suffering from this world you might remember it like a, a, a faint memory but but it'll be gone before you know it and eternity is so much greater and longer and better we can say things like the best is yet to come because it is coming you know i can't get back all the stuff outside of a miracle of god i can't get back all the stuff that was stolen from me you know, on this trip, I mean, I, I was so bad, and they smashed out the window and had the company come to the hotel, and they, they fixed up the window for us, and as they drove away, I looked at it from like an angle, and I realized that the, that the window that they put in to replace the one that had been broken, uh, it had a little bit of a wave to it on the glass. Not so much that you would know if you weren't looking for it, but, the, but I could see it because I was looking to check out their work, and Sure enough, it went up and down, and it was fixed, and I was so happy, and like no water's in the car, we're on our vacation, we have a window again, we can move on, we can put stuff in the vehicle, we can continue this, this evacuation vacation trip, and, and like, it's good, but, but the window, I can see now when I look at it, I can see like, I can see that it's a little different than the other side, and every time I walk up to the car, because I know what happened, I might, 
I might notice that. I might see it. I might remember all those things that were stolen from me that just felt like a punch in the gut. All those things I won't get back. All this stuff I had. And just, I'm going to remember that. But you know what was broken is now repaired. And what's stolen from you will one day be renewed. Like God will make all things new. And what the devil has come and destroyed in your life and what sin has ravaged, listen, what's been broken in your life, God will make whole. You just follow him. You trust that in faith that the best is coming. It's going to get better. We live in a world that's marked by sin and suffering, and we can't change that. But what we can do is advance the message of Jesus this greater. We can, we can love God and love people around us. We can help show people that there's a better way than the path of sin that leads to a horrible consequence. We can show them that although they're suffering in this world, there's a much better world coming, a world for those who are in Jesus that's unending. And, and yeah, you might remember, you might look and see the, the consequences of sin and you might not ever, ever be able to remember or forget that thing that happened back then, but, but there's better coming. And when you look back one day, you might even see good that God brought from the horrible. You might see this triumph that came from the tragedy. You might see a message that came out of the mess in your life. But man, as you trust in God, as you trust in God and walk with him, he and his presence will be with you regardless of what the pain is in your life. Let me leave with these words that I hope will be an encouragement to you this week as you think about these things. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away. We're suffering. These bodies are not going to last. This world that you may establish is not eternal here. He says, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. We find our strength inside. Verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So what we need to know is that although this world is filled with suffering, there's a Jesus in this world with us that knows pain. And although he was the only one that didn't deserve pain, he was the only good one among us, he experienced ultimate pain and they crucified him. But he did it willingly because he loves you. And he is with you in your pain and no one else around you may understand. I may not be able to fully understand your pain nor the person next to you may not be able to understand your pain, but there's one who does and he's with you in the pain and he'll walk with you through it. Right on. Thanks for joining Church Experience Online. Please don't forget to check out our website to get more connected, learn more, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially. You're now going to hear a Church Experience Worship original song. We hope this gives you time to worship and reflect on what you've just learned. We can move mountains, your strength surrounds. can move.